What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 195 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we have two returning guests for another I Am a Hardscaper roundtable rally. This is where we bring on past guests from the I Am a Hardscaper series, where we do a deep dive into their businesses and bring them back for a round table, sit them down and do an even deeper dive on specific topics in their business. And for this one, we've got two guests back from 2020. So it's been almost three years since we've had them back on the show. We've got Phil from PJE Lawn Care at PJE Lawn Care on Instagram and John from Signature Landscape. You can find him at Signature Landscape Corp on Instagram there. And this is an excellent episode with the two of them. And before we get into this episode, we want to say thank you to Cycle CPA for sponsoring today's episode. If you need bookkeeping, accounting, CFO services, reach out to CycleCPA.com or Cycle underscore CPA if you're on Instagram already there. And I also just want to say really quickly here, thank you to all those that have signed up for the How to Hardscape headquarters the belief in what we're trying to do with this system, the software that we're building here from budgeting, estimating and beyond, including incorporating our training videos so that you can do onboarding training systematically with the software, as well as everything that we've got planned for the future with this. Hopping on board early like this, it definitely saves you some money. And really, I can't say thank you enough to those that have already signed up and believe in what we're trying to do with it. But if you're not signed up, you only have a few more days left to claim a few perks that you get for signing up this early. One would be a discounted rate as well as locked in pricing. We are not going to raise your price if you sign up early with this software. So you're locked in at a discounted rate that nobody else will have moving forward. When we start onboarding in March, that rate will go up at least 20%. Additionally, we will be charging an onboarding fee in the future. So for those that sign up before we start onboarding in March, we'll have that onboarding fee waived. That will be free. But for those that sign up afterwards, not only will you not have the discounted locked in price, but you will also have that onboarding fee as well. So just a couple of perks to say thank you for those that are signing up early and believing in what we are trying to do here with this software. If you want to learn more, just shoot me a message at how to hardscape or you can learn more at members.howtohardscape.com there. And without further ado, let's get into today's I Am Hardscaper Roundtable Rally with Phil from PJE Lawn Care and with John from Signature Landscape. Today, we're joined by two returning guests here from the I Am A Hardscaper series. We have Phil from PJE Lawn Care. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. Good to see you. And we've got John from Signature Landscape Corp. John, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And uh, it's been a long time coming to set this up. Uh, we, You guys were back on the show in the early days, actually, 2020 about midway through, uh, and I've been wanting to get you guys back on for a round table here. So I'm excited to have you guys on the show once again here, and I figured we'd just start by catching up a little bit. Uh, 2020, year-end wrap-up, 2021, 2022. How, how did the year go for you guys? Uh, those actually a couple of years, did you accomplish what you set out to be? Any struggles, Anything? any talking points in general? Uh, that you would want to get into with this. Uh, John, you were the first one of the two uh, between you and Phil that were on the show. So maybe we'll start with you, John. Uh, 2021, 2022, did you accomplish your goals? Um, how did those two years go for you? If you can actually recall back to those instead of looking right. forward to 2023. John, whatever you want to talk about there. Awesome. Yeah, 21 was great. Uh, like everybody was just got to pick and choose your clients and... Uh... Uh, we had, uh, I think, a records for sales numbers. Everything was uh, everything was good. We had some good projects. I got the photographer out to get a lot of them uh, submitted for awards, and uh, we made it to uh, Unilock's Award of Excellence again. So proud of that. Uh, just overall good, yeah. Amazing, nice. I did see. Uh, was it you who uh, Sutton made the plaque to fill in the hole there for you? Yeah, that was 2020. So yeah, there was no award ceremony there. So I had a good streak running and Sutton made the joke of uh, making me a 2020 plaque for the pandemic here. Make sure my wall wasn't uh, 
left with a gap. <laughs> Absolutely. And then uh, on to you, Phil. Yeah, 2021, 2022, goals, uh, struggles, anything that came up during those two years for you? Yeah, so 2021 and 2022 were both record-breaking years for us with growth and sales numbers. Um Obviously, probably the same struggles as everybody else is experiencing with rapid material increases and um, things of that nature, having to change our contracting and the way we handle job payments and things like that to keep up with material changes. But uh, both years were great. 2021 was um, a roll off of the crazy influx of demand in 2020. Um, 2022 is, uh, and was, and we still have projects rolling into 2023, um, from 2022, but was, um, massive for us because of the, uh, market here locally and the, you know, new home construction and, um, low interest rates on these mortgages and people doing dream projects, you know, so, um, a lot of that's rolling over into 2023 and, you know, uh, we're selling into 2024, you know, so uh, cool. it, was, it was great. We broke all the records and, you know, just had to change the way we we did business a little bit to try to keep up with, you know, the changes in supplies and everything else. That's incredible. Yeah. Selling into 2024. Uh, with that being said, uh, during those past couple of years, are there any things that you anything that you doubled down on in terms of, you know, things were going right when you did this, you doubled down on it, whether that's services, uh, where, where your leads were coming from, where your employees were coming from, uh, equipment, whatever that might be, but anything that you found uh, since we've talked that you've really doubled down on and really focused on or even vice versa of that, that you steered away from that wasn't working. Uh, John or Phil, whoever wants to take that point and uh, run with it there. Sure. Uh, 2020, we bought a bunch of equipment uh, while equipment was available and uh, demo pricing was still a thing. So that ended up being real lucrative us, uh, lucrative to us um, to be able to buy these machines before equipment pricing surging and uh, to secure them at a low APR. Um, other stuff that we did and after 2020 and 2021 was uh, take more of the profits to do fall and spring pre-buys uh, to set ourselves up better for the season ahead, whether that be as simple as, you know, making sure that we have a pallet of sand glue or, you know, a couple dozen rolls of fabric to having credit with suppliers um, to be able to take advantage of that buying power to make sure that we're in our suppliers, you know, favorite customer list as a uh, almost a prepay. And then obviously there's associated discounts and and stuff making my money work better for me rather than just sitting on it and waiting for the next job cost to come through. Definitely. Nice. Absolutely. Phil, on to you. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, people who, who know me and know how we we run business around here. I mean, we doubled down on our, you know, happy client referral program. Um, you know, a lot of the same things John discussed, you know, early order, uh, early purchase programs, making sure we're set up for that. Um, we really developed our staff over the last two years, you know, uh, bringing guys up in the management level, taking things off of my plate, um, so that I can work more on the business, not in the business, you know, um, really pushing now with, you know, the, the changing in the economy and the direct goals of the government to slow down growth, um, to really try to capitalize on maintenance, um, you know, not only construction maintenance, but overall, you know, landscape and outdoor maintenance, um, and trying to test the waters to see how far we can stretch those margins because they're much tighter than design build is. Um, but building a staff and a team to, to really, you know, lock all that in and, and keep the security blanket there for when it all, when and if it all blows up, I mean, it's not <laughs> part of my plan, but you know, I'm sorry, most of my clients aren't going to fertilize their own lawn or turn on their own irrigation system or any of that stuff. So we, you know, 
our our objective is to lock all that in and you know take that as far as we can and, and grow it like we've grown the design build side of the company Bill, i got a follow-up for yeah. you on that yeah so as uh, somebody who's been unplugged from the maintenance end since 2015 it has been on my mind recently that a lot of companies in my area have repurposed their existing labor staff for the design build over the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, now I start to see this uh, drawback, or not drawback, um, the amount of contractors offering maintenance services in my region are is falling and the maintenance prices seem to go up. Um, maintenance is, like you said, a pretty secure industry to be in in a downturn. Um, do you see more people pushing back toward that or is that going to be a more lucrative spot than the three to 8% margin that's, you know, in it? Yeah. So I, you know, we've kind of, you know, there, I guess there's, this is kind of a multiple uh, way to answer your question. So in our market, the, the maintenance industry is bastardized. I mean, we got thousands of competitors in our market that are mowing grass and doing fertilizer and doing all that stuff. And they all do it cheaper than I do. Um, you know, so what, what we've really focused on is high end maintenance and open oh, okay. communication with clients that, you know, their expectation is that their property is always perfect or as close to perfect as it can be. Um, and we work on a monthly, you know, service charge to make sure they have a property manager. They've got the best guys out there, guys who care and have a passion for it. Um, and you know, we found that there's certain parts of maintenance, you know, and this is a hardscape show, but you know, to just kind of put it all out there, there's certain parts of maintenance that are extremely lucrative. You know, obviously you're never going to make money mowing grass, um, you know, and it's really tough to make money applying fertilizer. Um, but you know, when you go out there and you pressure wash and clean a paver patio, you trim somebody's sh shrubs, um, you know, you do spring and fall cleanup services and things of that nature. You know, those are very little output cost, um, with pretty high, uh, return on investment, you know, the biggest thing is like my, my director of outdoor maintenance, James is really selling tree and shrub care. You know, that stuff is, um, you know, 300% margins and there's like five yeah. competitors in our market that are doing it, you know? So, uh, if they think that we're too expensive, we challenge them to call, <laughs> call one of them because they're just more expensive than us. You know, we're the cheap guys in that industry and you know, it's that huge margins. So, you know, we're focusing on that stuff. And then, you know, we've just kind of given up on the the competing aspect of maintenance. You know, we tell people, okay. you find people to mow your grass cheaper than we can. You know, we're, we're mowing, we're generally speaking, you know, double the competitors, you know, um, particularly commercially, you know, I'm not going to go mow grass for $44 an acre. I, I just, uh, it doesn't doesn't make sense to me. Um, it doesn't matter how many trees they end up paying you to plant. If you're, if you're losing 50% every week while you're out there mowing grass, it doesn't make sense to me, but you know, the, the maintenance side of the business, I do think is, you know, we've had it since we started as a maintenance company just because I was young when I started my company and, you know, I couldn't get people to, um, you know, invest in large projects with me. I had to build a portfolio. So we did maintenance to kind of fill the gaps all the while trying to build the design build side of the company. And, you know, I've always had that urge. I, you know, it's an, it's an internal battle I've fought for the last 15 years. Do I hang on to maintenance? Do I just let it go? You know, on a really good year, you make 8% on okay. a really bad year. You, you break even, uh, uh -huh. And, you know, it, you do a couple million dollars to make, you know, some change in maintenance. Um, but I'll tell you what, it's always been our annuity. It also helps us on our back end uh, because we offer that lifetime workmanship warranty on our on our hardscape builds. Uh -huh. um, you know, our clients, in order to honor that warranty or maintain that warranty, 
essentially have to sign up for us on the maintenance side of the company, oh, interesting. Uh, you know, on the maintenance services, um, because in our warranty, it explicitly states, you know, that if any other contractor touches our work, the warranty is void. So that, you know, and, and I, I'm not, I don't try to backdoor these clients, you know, look, if they've got a buddy who does mulch, I'm not going to avoid their warranty because some guy can do mulch half my price. And if they're going to put all their eggs in other people's basket, you know, and they call me nine years down the road and expect me to fix a settling edge on their patio, you know, I'm going to say, look, that could have been handled with proper maintenance and proper care. You know, I'm probably not going to, you know, repair that. Now, if I have a client who has paid me for those nine years to mow their grass and fertilize their lawn and trim their shrubs and do all their outdoor services they could call me 20 years after the install and I'm going to go and fix that patio for them without batting an eye, you know, because they've invested in us long-term. Obviously we're not going to make the margins that we make on that design build, but they have chosen to stay loyal to PJE and loyal to our, our company and, and, you know, have been able to stive off all those guys that are doing it cheaper than us and, you know, stayed with us over the years. And so we'll honor a warranty as long as they live in the house, you know, as long as they're there and um, are continued clients of ours. And it, it explicitly states that in our warranty, you know, and that's that's a big part of our selling process on the design build thing, you know, when you're doing million dollar projects, half a million dollar projects, these people get a little overwhelmed with, Oh my God, what's the aftercare going to look like? And, you know, we just say right. Don't worry about it. You talk to James, he's going to take care of you. You're not going to have to worry about a thing. We'll take care of it. And, you know, um, and, and it works, you know, and I, I think that if you don't, I guess my advice on the maintenance side is you don't, you don't even try to be competitive with what the market sets the standard as just set your numbers where they have to be and you'll get what you get and you won't get what you don't get. And, you know, and, and you move on, there's plenty of work out there for everybody. And ultimately most of those people end up calling back, you know? So um, that's solid advice. Yeah. You know, I'm pro maintenance. I, I tell people, I think that even if it's not, you know, a, a huge chunk of your company, I think that every company that's in this space should have, you know, a couple, two or three guys at very least out. Even if all your are selling de design built, you should be selling your clients, you know, and every other year, pressure wash, repoly sand and seal, you know, just so that you can come back check on your work, check the status of your projects, see the development, stive off problems before they become bigger problems. If you see something, you can deal with it. And and ultimately that spins into more work, you know, that, and that's, that's kind of why I say that is being the friendly face out there is it, it always results in more work. The next project. Thanks. Yeah. That's, that's some solid points there. I just want to take a break from today's episode to talk about our sponsor, Cycle CPA. You may have a CRM or project management software in place, but what data are you using to ensure your estimating is accurate? Having a proper accounting setup and accurate bookkeeping done is key to understanding overhead expenses and other costs that must be recouped in your estimates. Cycle CPA is a remote bookkeeping and CFO firm that helps to connect the dots from the financial reports to the hardscape and landscape data needed in order to reach high profits. They provide landscape and hardscape industry benchmarking, job costing financials by service line, advisory meetings, and much more. Cycle CPA's team of accountants are specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry, and you can visit them at CycleCPA.com and for $200 off, mention the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. I'd be curious because, uh, Phil, from our last interview, you brought up that lifetime warranty there. Um, if, if it wasn't for the softscape maintenance side of that, uh, if you only had, say, hardscape maintenance, 
is there a package that you could offer or you think you could offer a client that would make sense for them to pay a recurring fee to do that pressure washing, resealing, uh, you know, polymeric sand, whatever that might be for that hardscape maintenance portion? Is there a do you believe there is a recurring revenue model surrounding that or is that more like if, if you're just doing hardscape maintenance, you are just it's it's a one off project, basically type of quoting. There's no recurring revenue model. And then I would want to know John's input on that, too. Uh, if you've ever thought about some sort of hardscape maintenance recurring revenue model with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I, I definitely think there is. I think there's margins in uh, hardscape maintenance. You know, there's there's not a ton of people out there doing it. Most most contractors are scared of it. You know, they don't want to go pressure wash a patio because they don't want to streak it up. They don't want to go, you know, do a re uh, a, reno a renovation on a patio because, you know, at very minimum, it's a three day process. You got to go day one, clean, let it dry. Day two, poly sand, let it dry, reseal. Day three, if you're lucky and you had the right weather, you know, it's 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 kind of a pain, you know, so a lot of contractors shy away from it, but. You know, early on, it would be a tough one for a small contractor, but any contractor that's done a couple hundred patios or a hundred patios for that matter. I mean, I'm not going to pull out my calculator right here and do the math, but I, if you did a hundred patios and you reached out to all those clients and said, hey, you know, we want to set you up on a routine maintenance of your patio so you're not getting all the moss, you're not getting all the, the junk. You know, we're going to come out every other year. We're going to pressure wash clean, repoly sand and seal. And you're going to pay a, a yearly fee for, for that service. You know, on off years, we'll come out and inspect. And if there's any settling, shifting or movement, we'll get that taken care of on those years. On the other year, we'll, you know, deep clean it, poly sand it and reseal it for you. You know, my, at least from my experience, 50% of those clients would jump at that opportunity to pay you to do that. Uh, because, you know, there's the old adage, my dad, when he was teaching me sales, when I was really young, used to just tell me, you know, you have to, your clients, everybody's clients value their time to some extent. So it's either they pay you to do it or they spend their weekends doing it with the fear that they're going to screw up their $50,000 investment. Um, you know, so I, I just, I look at it and I say, you know, when you're starting off your business, I mean, it's a pretty easy thing to kind of sell as a back end add on service, but anybody who's been doing it for a long time, if they're not offering it, they're just leaving money on the table and, and potential sales on the table, because let's, let's face it, you know, homeowner can forget you after nine years, you know, and the next time they want to do an addition on their house, you know, they Google hardscape guys or, you know, they call their neighbor because their neighbor just had a guy over there who did a great project for them. And, you know, they end up using that guy because you weren't at the forefront of who they remember or, or, you know, anything like that. So I tell people, be in front of your clients, be, you know, a constant on their properties, be in touch. Um, and if you can offer them a service, it's you know, sell that service. And, and like I said, in our market, there's probably, there's a lot, there's a lot of pressure washing companies out there that'll pressure wash, but they're scared of poly sand. They're scared of sealers, you know, and uh, they're scared of the time commitment that it'll take. So that's another one of those things, like I said, tree and shrub care. You know, if I tell somebody it's going to cost them $3,500 to pressure wash, clean, repoly sand and seal their patio, that's 500 square feet. You know, there's nobody in the market to compare that price to, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, we're setting the standard there and, you know, it's, it's a nice little, you know, thing to fill your schedule with, or, you know, have a couple guys out, you know, I, I think it's a value add for, for everybody. And I do think that even if I wasn't doing the, the landscape maintenance and I was just doing design build, I would have that as a part of my, design build side of my company so that I can offer that lifetime workmanship warranty. You know, uh, I'm, there may be some additional expense up front because I'm not banking on making the money for the next 10 years off of all their maintenance, but 
you know, I, I just, I don't see it any other way. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. I, I think everybody should be offering lifetime workmanship warranties if you believe in your work. John, your thoughts on that? And have you, have you toyed around in, in terms of creating some sort of hardscape maintenance package for your clients? Um, I have not uh, because of the size we are and the size I want to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, I would agree that the, the pressure washing, sanding and sealing is it's very similar to like your deck staining outfits. Uh, it's very weather orientated. So, you know, you may go out, wash two, three patios and then wait for that perfect day to re-sand and seal. Um, I've messed around with it a little bit, but, you know, um, I usually tell the customers, you know, like I build the Ferrari, I don't polish it. Um, and I, but I don't leave them hanging out to dry. Uh, we have a good contractor in our area that kind of uh, just, um, it's called Sure Sealed, and they're Unilock, um, I don't know, authorized, but they're Unilock recommended um, as their go to to fix their issues. And they come out for usually a square footage price to pressure wash, clean, and seal so that I can remind the clients, you know, that that is an important part of the process. But um, the more I go out with a pressure washer and a, uh, a can of sealer, the more that my expensive equipment stays back because I don't have a designated division for um, maintenance. Um, it's not a good spinoff for me to have equipment sitting or design build projects waiting to go out and clean and seal. Yeah, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I've been trying to wrap my brain around what a hardscape maintenance recurring revenue model would actually look like and the benefits to the actual client with that. And um I don't know. It's difficult for me to try to, but I I think what it may look like, at least in my business would be like Phil offers that lifetime warranty where they are spending that, you know, yearly amount with you. Um, Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me, I think. And uh, for sure. And a company that size, that makes a ton of sense to be able to, you know, put that into your high end maintenance package and, and explore that route. Um, But somewhere in the underneath five employees we want to put them in and warranty them and refer great subcontractors to maintain them definitely definitely yeah i mean like i said i got a little bit of an unfair uh, advantage on that i've got 30 guys that run my maintenance side of my company so yeah you know um it's it's it, we have a different business model than than most because we are you know a little bit larger and have a lot of employees um, available and ready to go, you know, at no point do we have to choose maintenance over a design build project. Cause we've run those two parts of our company kind of completely yep. separate, you know? So I get exactly what John's saying. And that's how we were for a really long time until we got to the point where our clients are like, look, we don't want to call anybody else. We just, we only want to deal with you. And it's like, okay, well, you know, then, then we need to be selling this service too. Yeah. And and on that point, I did decide to subcontract it for a little bit because on that same philosophy, Hey, you call me, I'll handle it. I'll have the right people there. And it just got a little bit messy um, with the scheduling of the weather and the clean and the good days and the bad days. Um, also, if a problem came up um, now because it's underneath my umbrella or say I could be you know, liable for that, um, it created more heartache than the revenue was worth. Um, so it made more sense to give the referral to a non-competing clean and seal business. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, absolutely. My thought process on that is that um, even though I'm still small, I could have a division based on the leads that come in just um, doing lift and relays and they could be the division that goes and cleans up the install division uh, that does like the polymeric sand, the sealing, the cleaning up of everything while also still staying busy with lift and relays. And then we could introduce that sort of recurring maintenance hardscape model, but uh, Uh still trying to wrap my head around how that would actually look like and what that would uh, work. But, but sticking on the point with you guys in in differing business models and your outlook for 2023, I guess, kind of turning the page on that there. uh, Are you guys trying to actively grow through 2023? Uh, What are your, I guess, uh, thoughts on how the year may go 
plans to be able to grow or to stay stagnant and, and focus on profit? I mean, what are your plans for 2023 in your different business models? For me, um, yeah, sure. For me, I'm on a more main, maintain. Uh, this is will be our, I think that's our second year out of uh, out of snow. So I'm still playing with those numbers on how that all goes down. Um, I'm also in the process of building a facility, um, and that is going to take a lot of my time. So my 23 is I'm focusing on sales, um, trying to get booked up so that if there is a correction or a softness mid-year that we are solid throughout the year and then sales and management so that my employees can keep producing and that I can be distracted with the new facility. Yeah. So, so our, our goals for this year are uh, actually, we just covered, we, we just had this man, manager's meeting. <clears throat> um, there, it, It's not directly to grow. However, the way our model works, we, we kind of by default grow every year um, or we have since we've been in business, uh, but more focused this year on, um, you know, keeping our margins where they're set at and cutting waste and cutting loss out of the equation. Um, you know, we'll project about a 10% growth uh, this year, because that's what we've averaged uh, organically. Um, you know, we've never like directly marketed anything outside of social media posts and things like that. So uh, we have no plans of changing that. But uh, I think our management team's goal this year is to hang on to all the profits and get better um, with our internal and external communication uh, with clients and, um, you know, just to maximize the profits, you know, we'll grow by 10% is, is, is my projection. Uh, but that, that's just because we're always doing new projects and those clients are ultimately 50% of them are signing up for us with total maintenance and um, you know, and, and our projects are huge. I mean, we have projects that take six, nine months. I've got a couple projects on the books that are going to take 12 months or longer. Um, you know, that, that will, will, you know, accelerate that growth on paper. And as far as numbers go, um, you know, if you sell a couple million dollar plus projects, you, you know, all of a sudden your growth forecast looks huge. So, um, you know, we're just, we're focusing as a team on, on maximizing profits and holding on to the, the dollars that, that are available to us. Uh, what about when it comes to employees, at least in the past couple of years, and then looking forward, uh, where, where have you guys focused on growing your team? Where have you found, where have you found the best way to find employees and especially uh, employees that stick around with you for the mid to longer term, hopefully, uh, employee situation. How has that looked like in your business? Where have you found the best employees for your business? I mean, we, so, so our, our method of finding employees, I've kind of ditched all the online advertisers and all that. We've never really had any luck whatsoever with that. Um, you know, occasionally, particularly in 2020 and 2021, when, it was really, really hard to, to find people. <laughs> we would put like, we would cast like help me ads out on Facebook just personally. And my management team would do the same. Like, Hey, we're hiring. If you know anybody looking for a job, get them in contact with us. And we were basically hiring anybody that walked through the door that was able-bodied and can go out and that we thought we could train, um, you know, then we, we went to, I, I, I heard on a different podcast somewhere, a guy said he had a lot of luck with, you know, employee referral bonuses, basically, you know, bringing in all your employees and saying, Hey, look, if you get a, a good guy to come in and he makes it 30 days, I'll give you 200 bucks. If he makes it, you know, 90 days, I'll give you another 400 bucks. And if he makes it, you know, six months, I'll give you you know, another 500 bucks and it's an $1,100 bonus for that employee that you already had to bring somebody else on. 
that they believe is going to last because they want that bonus. And and on the other term, they're holding that guy accountable because if the guy doesn't show up or has attendance issues or things like that, they don't get their bonus. You know, so we had a lot of luck with that. And that's actually carried over. We actually stopped it because we were having too many. We had too many applications and too many guys that weren't really the right fit. So we stopped it. And I mean, just for instance, just this morning, what was it, James? 12? You had 10 or 12 guys come in? We had 10 guys, 10 or 12 guys show up this morning for applications, you know, because we kind of told our employees just yesterday, you know, hey, you know, we're going to be, you know, starting back to full time because we do winter hours in the winter. We go back to full time on March 6th. So we just at our company meeting on, on Monday, we just said, hey, guys, you know, March 6th is the day. If you got any buddies or anybody looking for work, you know, bring them in. We had 12 guys show up today. We had a, a couple guys call yesterday, um, you know, and we're not even offering the referral program anymore. Our guys just want to bring in people that they know and that they want to work with. And, um, you know, and, and it's – I'm not beyond offering that referral bonus again, if we got into a point where we were desperate again, but um, you know, it probably cost me 15 or $20,000 between 2020 and 2021 and into 2022. Uh, but we were able to stay fully staffed and at some points overstaffed, which I felt was a blessing at times uh, when I'm talking to other buddies in the industry that, you know, can't get two guys to stay on staff for a whole year. Um, you know, and, and we don't have much, much turnover. We try to make it a good place to work. We try to make, you know, these guys make an honest living. Um, and so generally speaking, what we've kind of found is if a guy makes it beyond that six months, we've either got to screw something up to get them to leave or, um, uh, they end up getting some type of offer somewhere else that we can't match. You know, that's really the only two reasons why people leave um, after six months. So that's kind of what we've found. And on to you, John, any uh, employee issues that you've experienced or, uh, you know, where, where are your employees coming from uh, to remain staffed where you're at? So I've been blessed with the crew of guys that have been with me for, I think, seven years now. So uh, we don't have much turnover. Um, I did lose uh, one employee last year uh, to rail yard union was doing a uh, like a splurge hiring to bring on 15 or 20 people. And it's hard to compete with union benefits and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this year we'll bring on one extra guy. So all of these tips on um, and tricks to doing that are well received because that's something that I haven't had to navigate in quite a few years. Hey, do you have a budget set for 2023? Are you starting the estimating process with a budget in place to ensure that you are recovering your overhead expenses, labor, material costs, profit, and other hidden expenses within your business? Do you know that you're making profit on certain projects throughout the year? If you're struggling with any of these things, then the How to Hardscape headquarters can help you this year. Check it out at members.howtohardscape.com or shoot me a message at How to Hardscape on Instagram. This software will streamline processes in your business. It's going to help you budget, estimate, ensure that you are making profit on projects throughout the year and help you adjust throughout the year. We're also going to be continuously improving this software to include more and more features as well as the content that's already available to members right now if you're looking to train your employees as they come in. So once again, members.howtohardscape.com, the price will continuously go up as more features and as more content is offered over there. So there's never a bad time to get signed up with that. And with that being said, let's get back to the episode. When it comes to um, your guys' time in the industry, I'm going to make a, a hard left turn here. Uh, your guys' time in the industry, what have you seen uh, change over the years in terms of your time in business, whether that's from the start of your business to now, or uh, changes in the industry that you've seen take effect and how that will affect our time in the industry moving forward? You know, how has your experience through your career in the industry changed and shaped the way you've done business 
uh, and will continue to do business? This is kind of a very open ended question to see uh, kind of where you guys would want to take a response to something like this. But your time in the industry, how has it changed business, uh, industry wise, whatever that might be? But what are those changes that you've seen? And whoever wants to take that there. One of the things that I've noticed just in the seminars from Unilock and uh, Tackle Block um, is the new entrepreneurs, the guys that are just starting out, are going right into CRM softwares um, instead of playing the guessing game that I did when, you know, just trying to figure out what other company, landscape companies charge when you first start out. Um, so that's very encouraging to see new companies start up with design softwares and CRM softwares right off the bat. And uh, I feel like that's a strength going forward in the industry that, that there's less, you know, truck in the truck, staying in the vans out there, um, lowballing professional contractors. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I'll, I'll touch on that one as well. Phil, uh, anything else you, you've seen? Yeah. So I've seen a lot. I touched on this last time we talked a little bit, I believe. And, um, you know, being in business 19 years now and, and in the industry for, uh, almost 24, um, uh, you know, I, I came into the industry when a back, a really special backyard was a 400 square foot wood deck with a pool with four feet of concrete around it. And uh, you might be stretching it to put in a natural gas fire pit. Uh, when, when I broke into the industry, at least in our market, that was like, you know, top of the line backyard, um, you know, and now we're seeing, you know, this, this new younger generation, my age, people who are building homes or buying homes, you know, would, would much rather invest in their backyards and want to stay home. Um, you know, even more so now post pandemic, but even before that we were seeing our project sizes grow drastically. I mean, if you, if you go back to 2000 and, and, you know, seven, 2008 before the, the major crash, you know, the, an average backyard project was, you know, 70,000 bucks, you know, and, and that would be a, a paver patio, some fire feature of some type and maybe a, a paver patio around a pool with a landscape package. And I mean, scale that to today and an average backyard project, at least that we're on, um is you know north of 350 to 500 somewhere in that ballpark um and it's got all the bells and whistles i mean they want to be able to put the chase loungers out they want to be able to go spend an entire day in their backyard and feel like they're at a resort um a big part of that is a change in the real estate market uh, at least locally, you know, in 2010, a real estate agent would tell a homeowner that, oh, no, you don't want a pool because a pool automatically eliminates 50% of the buyers, you know, because they don't want pools. And so for a long time, a, a pool was just an expense that um, saw no ROI. You know, in the last five years, we've seen that completely 180, at least in our market, where, you can have two homes that are relatively exactly the same, same square footage, same bed, same baths. Um, and the house with the the pool will sell for 10 to 12% higher than the house without. Um, even if it's a poorly designed project, they're still getting more money because this new generation of people want that um, and, and don't want to have to go through the process to get it. Um, so it's been majorly beneficial for us in our market, you know, to see that real estate agents and property investors and things like that are seeing a value in outdoor living. You know, like I said, I mean, now every custom home I'm on has a, a big covered terrace off the back of the house, you know, as part of the initial construction project. You know, you go, you just go back 10 years and no houses had that. I mean, or very few had that. Uh, now builders don't build a house without an amazing back porch. 
you know, and, and those are just signs of the changing expectations of what clients are expecting when they build or they buy a house. Um, and, and it's really changed the game as far as what we're able to do, particularly when they read in magazines that they, they should invest 10% in their outdoor spaces. So if they build a $2 million house, that leaves us $200,000 to play with, you know, and a lot of them overspend, but you know, it's, it's, it's changed the game over the last 20 years. If you were to hire, I, I don't know where you guys are at with this and especially two different uh, size businesses, but uh, this could be a, a good way to get into uh, hiring. If you were to hire your next non-labor producing employee, what position would you be hiring for? So out of the field, in the office, uh, what, what would be that employee that you hire? Uh, I'll start. Yep. I, I, I would hire an experienced estimator. And why is that, Phil? Um, you know, because me and my director of design and sales do, you know, 98% of the uh, estimating. You know, my office gals can help on some of the small stuff and, you know, the straightforward things. But um, it bogs us down instead of being out at, at client meetings and, you know, uh, drumming up more business and doing that kind of stuff. We're sitting, you know. So I spend my Tuesdays doing is estimating projects. <laughs> so, you know, I could have a full day uh, opened up or, or more, you know, it, it, there's times where I have two or three days a week stuck in the office estimating. Um, and the, I've, I've, I've struggled with it because um, it's a tough, it, it's not like a home home estimator or something like that. I mean, you have to have the field knowledge. You have to be able to understand a wall height and that when you, when you build an SRW wall, you've got a course below grade or two courses below grade. You have to be able to understand the sites. And so we've really struggled with finding that. I, I mean, I would love to have an experienced estimator that understood the, the business that we're in. That'd be my first, first hire. Would that mean you would have a salesperson, an estimator, and a designer kind of coordinating in on that? Or would you have like a salesperson become also the estimator or, or you know, any combination of those? No. So I would, I, I believe that a designer, I, I believe a designer has to be the salesperson. I think that those, that's a, that's one of the same position, in my opinion. I think that, you know, if you design it, you should be selling it. <clears throat> um, you know, if not, you need to be very involved in the design process so that, you know, you know, you're hearing what the client's asking for, you're knowing. I mean, I think that's just part of the to, to help close the deal. Designing and sales kind of come one and, you know, come together. Um, I think an estimator can just kind of help uh, expedite that process. You know, because obviously design sales, you're out there trying to design and sell projects, but the, the tedious side of it is sitting down and putting numbers to everything and mm -hmm. dotting your I's and crossing your T's. If, if we could reduce that time spent on that by just reviewing an estimate and making sure everything's in there and the, the margins are there, um, I think it makes, it opens up a lot of room for additional sales because you're not consuming your time sitting at a computer estimating projects. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, uh, John, you, you yourself, uh, next non labor producing employee, if you had to hire one right now, what would it be? I think I'm on that same path, but a little bit lighter. Um, I have been looking more into subcontracting design work, um, okay. finding that, that unicorn that, uh, Bill's talking about with the designer estimator and salesperson. I mean, some people are good at design. Some people are good at sales. Some people are math people and doing estimates. Um, that's a that's a that's a tough person to find, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was like a previous business owner in this industry or something that decided to you know jump ship and be that person. Um, but for my size and and uh, and uh, what my payroll can support, I think at this time it would be a designer that works closely with me and um, takes some of that stress off so that I can be the salesman and uh, the estimator.
our our hour has flown by, guys. So I do have just one last question for you. I've kind of taken this interview and, and gone sporadically to a bunch of different topics here. So thank you for bearing with me here. Uh, and I've got another uh, question that's out of left field here. And this is uh, in the past, since we've spoken, since, since 2020, are there any um, tools, equipment, uh, and that, that can be very broad, that can be in-office tools, software, that can be uh, in the field, tools, equipment, whatever that might be, anything that you've implemented, or even system, a system that you've created in your business uh, that has really kind of moved the needle uh, in terms of profit, in terms of efficiency, whatever that might be, tools, equipment, whatever that is uh, that you've implemented in these past two years uh, that has helped you. Uh, whoever wants to start off with this one. On the back end, we... Uh I'm onboarded with a new CRM software last year. So uh, we're, I feel like last year there was a little bit of uh, opportunity lost as we navigated that path. But going into this year, I feel stronger that it will um, continue to produce profitable jobs. Um, and on the, on the field end, um, anything in the mini line, whether it's a mini excavator, mini skid steer, all of these things have worked well. And then the associated um, accessories that come with those, whether it's ground mats, um, or, um, anything to lessen our impact and give, uh, us less restoration on the, uh, job site has proven worth its weight. And then just to follow up there, John, uh, I think you signed up for synced up. What, what has that software helped you with implementing, uh, and how, how, what was the decision to actually implement a, any software into your business? Why did you feel you needed it? And what has it helped you with? Um, I needed a little bit more guidance and a formula, a, a formalized budget. Um, but one of the, the back end things, because we're a small company and there's only so many things that I can do, um, I was very impressed with its ability to sync with QuickBooks and um, streamline the estimate approval and invoicing steps of a salesperson or estimates job um, and that it just it just made my life easier and anything that makes my life easier I'm usually uh, a proponent of right <laughs> and then uh, Phil you yourself uh, tools equipment systems processes software past two years what was kind of moved the needle for you a little bit um, so we started a um, <laughs> yeah, really simple process of um, using WhatsApp um, company-wide um, so that foremen and managers, salespeople, uh, designers, and everything, we can, uh, and there's other softwares out there to do it. We just found this one was easy and it was free uh, to kind of file the design, um, put all the paperwork and all the estimates and stuff together, give the employees access to that, and then daily communication, putting their putting their work on there, progress photos, um, and creating files where, you know, like underground conduits and drainage lines and electrical lines and all that stuff, filing that stuff in, uh, into a system and having kind of an open, clear communication link that everybody uses instead of text or email, because it's hard to get guys to, you know, keep that stuff. Um, and, um, you know, so we started, we started using WhatsApp across the company, um, to, to just kind of improve our internal communication and making sure everybody's on the same page because, and it, it was to solve a problem of, you know, guys getting done at the end of the day, coming back, clocking out and then project managers or, um, you know, managers in general didn't really know what was achieved the day before, because they, they weren't able to make it out to the job at the end of the day to see it or whatever. And that just allowed, um, you know, everybody to be more prepared for the following day. Um, and then for, you know, because we, we do things in waves, we have different hardscape guys, we have landscape install guys, we have, you know, grading guys to have everybody have access to the progress, you know, so when the lighting guys go out there, they know where the irrigation lines are. They know where the sleeves are underneath the sidewalks and uh, walkways. They can access all that information. Um, and that was, I mean, that's really helped us. And it's, it's very easy because 
most of our employees were already using WhatsApp in some way, shape or form uh, personally. So they already knew how to use it. We didn't have to train, uh, you know, spend a ton of time on training of it. It was just kind of like a, we had one meeting we said, this is what we're doing. This is what the expectation is. And everybody jumped on board and we've had very few problems with it since we started doing that. Uh, really quickly, Phil, in terms of using WhatsApp, I'm not super uh, knowledgeable on WhatsApp, but are you creating a, say, like a group chat for every project and then you'll add like the foreman and whatever workers into that chat for specific projects? Or what's your sort of uh, system in place for that? Yeah, exactly. So we're, okay. we're kind of creating group chats, um, you know, and you have an admin, it's usually the project manager or, you know, if it's every one of our maintenance clients has one as well so that they can, you know, look back on things. All oh, these people don't want trimmed or, you know, whatever else don't touch their hydrangeas. Um, and it gives everybody in that, in that group chat access to that folder of, of everything. Um, and, and then, like I said, it's also something for us, um, because they're taking before and after photos every day, it kind of, you track progress. And if you have a client, it's like, oh no, the guys didn't do that. Or they weren't here when they get the bill a couple weeks later, it's like, well, we go back to the WhatsApp, we send them the, the photos, you know, and they're all time stamped automatically on WhatsApp and, you know, you send them all that stuff and, um, it, it just works out. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very simple system. Um, and you know, it, it was pretty easy for us to implement and it's really helped us internally with communication. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And guys, uh, we've reached our time limit here. I really appreciate your time. I still have lots of questions for you, but, uh, this was already a widespread topic discussion here so uh closing thoughts closing remarks anything that you want to leave the audience with as well as where can our audience go and find you uh john can you kick us off with that closing thought uh closing comments closing remarks anything you want to leave the audience with as well as where can our audience go find you well thanks mike no i'm i'm happy you had me on here today and it was awesome that i got to uh talk with phil and you on on the larger company status. So that was an awesome uh, pairing. So I compliment you on that. Um, as for finding me, go on Instagram, Signature Landscape Corp. Um, give us a follow, check out some of the stuff that we've done and the equipment that we run. Um, and again, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And Phil, yourself. Yeah. So it was a pleasure to, to speak with John and yourself. Um, I appreciate you having us on here. Uh, happy to do it anytime you want me to. Um, you know, uh, anybody can find us at, at PJU Lawn Care on Instagram, uh, PJU Landscaping on Facebook, or at www.pjulandscaping.com. Um, you know, and um, we're, we're always available to chat. So, you know, I appreciate it. Awesome. Phil, John, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Once again, we want to say thank you to uh, Phil and John that have come on the show here once again. Phil, PJE Lawn Care, at PJE Lawn Care on Instagram. John, at Signature Landscape Corp. These are two great guests that we've had on a few years ago now, and I've been waiting to get them back on and get them onto a roundtable for this. Two very interesting business models for the two of them there. And we could have gone so much deeper, but hopefully they will come back on the show in a future roundtable rally to do an even deeper dive into their businesses there. Give them some love on their Instagram channels and thank you to Cycle CPA for sponsoring today's episode. That's Cycle underscore CPA on Instagram if you want to give them a shout for bookkeeping, accounting, or CFO services as well as www.cyclecpa.com to get started there. We'll mention How to Hardscape to get $200 off their services. And final call for the How to Hardscape headquarters software. Shoot me a message at How to Hardscape on Instagram or head on over to members.howtohardscape.com and you can book a demo there. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.